Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing super, super well. Welcome to today's video. So today we're gonna be doing an update on a couple of cases that I have covered on this channel. I was getting so many comments on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you know, everywhere of people letting me know, oh my gosh, did you find out that Julio's killers were caught? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about the Idaho case updates? So my messages have been filled with you guys letting me know about these updates. So I thought today would be a good day to sit down and just give you guys some updates on some of the cases. So today I'm gonna give you guys an update on what happened in the investigation for Julio Ramirez, Yanira Cedillos, and the four University of Idaho students that were murdered in November of last year. Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. But yeah, that's pretty much what we're gonna be doing in today's video. Thank you guys so much for being here and for being the best familia ever. If it wasn't for you guys, I would not be able to spread awareness on these cases. So thank you guys so much for watching and for helping me share these stories. Before we get into today's video, I I quickly want to thank today's sponsor, Factor. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's video. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. Their team of gourmet chefs create each meal using only ingredients with integrity to help you feel your best all day long. Now, Factor is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. You guys, I'm not even kidding you when I say that me and Jose get so excited every single day to come home and see what Factor meal we're going to choose that day. The meals are so good. We got the calorie smart meal plan, but there are so many other meal plans you can choose from. What I love about Factor is that your meals are delivered fresh, never frozen to your door. So you just get your packaging, you get your meals, you heat them up in the oven or the microwave, and then you can enjoy it in less than two minutes. I just really love how Factor has cut down on grocery trips and cooking, so there's more time for other things. Now their smoothies are also really good, you guys. Like these have been my go-to lately, so I highly recommend you guys check them out. If you want to try Factor, make sure to go to Factor75 Dot com or click the link down below and use code JackieFlores50 to get 50% off your first Factor Box. That's JackieFlores50 for 50% off your first Factor Box. Thank you again to Factor for sponsoring today's video. So let's start off by talking about what happened to University of Idaho students Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin. Just to refresh, on the night of November 12th, 2022, Kaylee and Madison decided to have a girls' day and they went out to a local bar called The Corner Club in Moscow, Idaho at around 10 p.m. They were there for a couple of hours and at about 1.40 in the morning, Kaylee and Madison were seen on video getting some food from a local food truck and then they went back to their house at around 1.00. 1:45 a.m. Now, Kaylee used to live at this house when she was studying at the University of Idaho. However, at this time she had moved out, but she did come back during this time period to visit her friends and get some of her belongings. So even though she no longer lived there, she was still going to be spending the night there. Now, this house on King Road consisted of Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and two other roommates who at this time are going to remain anonymous. I'm just going to refer to them as DM and BF. So at at around 1.45 in the morning, Madison and Kaylee returned to this house on King Road and started to get ready for bed. As for Zana and her boyfriend Ethan, they went to a local party and they got back to the house also at around 1.45 in the morning. Now, Ethan didn't live there. This was just a house for girls, like I mentioned, but him and Zana had been dating for a while, so he would often spend the night there. The pair got home from the party and Zana actually ordered a DoorDash order that was delivered at around 4 o'clock in the morning. Her phone records also showed that she was on TikTok at about 4.12. However, we're not really sure if this was Zana or if she accidentally left her phone unlocked and, you know, TikTok was still rolling. So we're not sure if she was actually physically on TikTok or if her phone was just doing that. Now, like I mentioned, there were two other roommates that lived in this house, DM and BF. So Maddie Mogan and Kaylee Gonzalez were sleeping on the third floor upstairs. Roommate DM and Zana and Ethan were sleeping on the second floor. And then the last roommate, BF, was sleeping 
living all by herself on the first floor. The next morning on November 13th, roommates DM and BF called some friends to come over to the house because they thought that one of the victims on the second floor had passed out and they weren't waking up. So at around 11.58 in the morning, a 911 call was placed from one of the roommate's cell phones requesting help for an unconscious person. Police arrived at the scene and that's when they discovered that Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan had been murdered. This case immediately went viral on social media because people were so confused as to why this had happened. Why were these four University of Idaho students targeted and how did the two other roommates survive this? A few weeks after the murders on December 30th, 2022, 28-year-old Brian Koberger was arrested and charged for the murders of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Carnodal, and Ethan Chapin. Like I said, if you want to know more details about the investigation and how all this went down, I will link the video down below. So much has happened since Brian was arrested in December of last year. Some crazy rumors have gone out about the case. There is so much speculation. It's actually very crazy. Like if you go on TikTok and you search up this case, you will literally go down a rabbit hole of just insane theories as well as Reddit. Reddit is just as crazy. So because of all the rumors and speculation and just how viral this case has gotten, there was actually a gag order placed on the investigation. So the victim's families are not allowed to come out and speak out about what is currently happening. Brian's attorneys aren't allowed to speak about it. I mean, no one involved is allowed to make any public statements. As of now, in April of 2023, Brian has yet to enter a plea and he is being held without bail in the Lataw County Jail in Idaho following his December arrest. Now, even though he hasn't entered a plea, he has made statements saying that he honestly believes he's going to be exonerated and that he did not do this. Reporters and past detectives have come out and they said that they can almost guarantee that one of the prime defense strategies that Brian is going to have during this trial is that they're going to try to argue that prosecution had tunnel vision during the investigation. They're going to argue that they only focused on Brian and that they stopped looking for any other culprits that could potentially be responsible for the murders. They stopped chasing down any other leads and they did whatever they could to make the theory that Brian is the one that did this work. I honestly have a feeling too that that's most likely what they're going to do. You know, they're going to try to make it seem like police only focused on Brian and that the real killer is still out there somewhere. I feel like they're also going to try to make DM's testimony be doubted since she did witness the killer leaving the home. You know, she was able to identify that the killer was tall, that he was skinny and athletically built, that he had bushy eyebrows. I mean, DM's testimony is so vital. So a lot of people are worried for her because they know that the defense team is going to go in on her and try to cast doubt. The prosecution needs to be ready for anything, so they are actually seeking bank and social media information tied to Kaylee, Madison, Zana, and Ethan. That way they can build a better digital picture of the crime and, you know, see if there's any type of connection between Brian and the victims. You know, what everyone wants to know is what was the motive for this? Why did he target these four students? Were they all the target or was one specific person the target? Prosecutors are asking for information from Apple, Amazon, Amazon, Google, DoorDash, Meta, Snapchat, and Tinder, as well as information from Walmart. You know, they're just trying to gather as much information as possible so that if any doubt is raised during the preliminary hearing or during the trial, they will be ready with an answer. So as of now, we're just waiting for the preliminary hearing to begin in June of this year. And if you're not familiar with what a preliminary hearing is, it's basically when prosecutors have to show that they have enough evidence to bring Brian to trial. So right now, I'm sure the prosecutor is very busy getting all of this information together. I cannot imagine how much information and, you know, evidence, footage, DNA, you know, things that they have to go through to get ready for this hearing. Now, a lot of questions I was getting on my YouTube video and on my TikToks about this were, what is going to happen to the house? You know, is the owner going to sell the house? Is the owner going to demolish it? You know, what's going to happen with it? Well, the University of Idaho has come out with a statement and said that the house will be demolished as a healing step. The house, which is located located near the university campus was given to the school by the owner and that's when the university decided that they wanted to demolish it. They want to tear down the house and, you know, get rid of the constant reminder of what happened to Ethan, Zana, Madison, and Kaylee. You know, the demolition removes the physical structure where the crime took place and it removes efforts to further sensationalize the crime because a lot of people were actually traveling to Idaho to specifically visit the house. I saw a couple of TikToks of people standing outside the house trying 
trying to do readings with their cards, trying to see if there was like a ghost there that could tell them, you know, what exactly happened. And I get that people are curious and they just want to know what happened, but I feel like going to the house and trying to do like a card reading or trying to find like a ghost presence is not okay. It kind of reminds me of what happened with the Shannon Watts family home, how people were literally showing up to the house. They were trying to film inside. They were saying that they saw the ghost of one of the little girls. I mean, things got really crazy. I don't believe that house was demolished. I believe it's still there, but the University of Idaho just wants to prevent this from happening because they feel like true crime tours are gonna continue to travel there. They're gonna try to make videos outside of the house and you know the university and the community just doesn't want that however there was a petition created calling on the university to preserve the property a lot of people do not want this house to be gone because according to the petition it says that all the victims had fun and you know they made memories in this house and that they would most likely not want their house to be destroyed I feel like that's very odd to make like unless all of the victims families have come out and said yeah we actually don't want the house to be demolished you know this is where the girls and ethan had good memories and you know a good life then that would be okay but i do not believe that the victims families are involved in this petition so the fact that strangers are saying oh the girls and ethan had such happy memories there like it shouldn't be demolished they wouldn't want it to be demolished is crazy to me so i don't know who created this petition or why they care so much if the house is still there but the university of idaho says that no matter what people are saying they're going to demolish the house they have not set a date yet as to when this is going to happen but they're hoping that by the end of the current semester the house will be gone the university is also planning on making a memorial for the four victims they're working on trying to build them like a garden with some benches on campus that way you know they can honor the students and you know they don't feel like the house is a place where there should be a memorial there the university of idaho says the home where four students were murdered in no or back in november of last year that home will be demolished. In a memo sent to the University of Idaho students and employees this morning, the owner of the home on King Street offered to give the home to the university, which they did accept. They say the demolition removes efforts to further sensationalize the crime scene. They also say they are currently evaluating options on what to do with the property after the home is torn down. No word on when that demolition will happen. The university says that planning is currently underway to create a healing garden and memorial somewhere on campus for the victim. Yeah, I'm curious to know what you guys think about this. Like, do you guys think it should be demolished? What do you guys think about the petition? One of the most recent updates with this case literally happened this week. So one of the surviving roommates was asked by Brian Koberger's attorneys to testify in his upcoming preliminary hearing in June. Even though her name has been revealed publicly, I'm still going to go by her acronym BF. So remember, BF is the roommate that was sleeping on the first floor all by herself. She didn't hear anything. She didn't witness, you know, Brian or the alleged killer leaving the house, nothing. Now, after the murders, she actually moved to Nevada. So Brian's attorneys are asking a Nevada court to compel BF to travel all the way back to Idaho and testify as a witness for Brian in his preliminary hearing. The defense claims that BF has information that is exculpatory to Brian. According to court documents obtained by CNN, they state that BF's information is unique to her experiences and cannot be provided by another witness. Now, BF is trying to push this back. Her attorney actually filed a motion on Friday to end the subpoena, and this motion argues that the defense's demand is without support and that there really is no reason why BF needs to testify. She already gave all the information she knows about this case to investigators, to the attorneys. You know, they just don't feel like this needs to happen. Turn back to those documents, those the, the the legalese, it is sticky stuff. Let's be clear. I mean, the fight that's going to go on between Idaho and Nevada over a young girl, you know, she's just out of her teens. Whether she's going to have to be hauled back into the horror zone. I mean, that's really what it is, right? Koberger's attorneys wanting her to come and back him. There's somebody who doesn't have to imagine it because he lives in this world. It's Dave Ehrenberg. He's the state prosecutor in Palm Beach County. Because I kind of feel like there's going to be this hearing in Nevada, right, where a judge will decide. Was I off base thinking that? I only have 10 seconds. No, I think they will. And I think she will be compelled to go back to Idaho and testify because all the doubts go in the defense's favor. 
they're going to make sure he gets a fair yeah. trial. Now, it's not known at this point what information BF has and why it could help Brian. People don't understand what BF could have seen that night that would help him, especially because she was on the first floor and, like I mentioned, she didn't hear or see anything that night, at least to the public's knowledge. A lot of people are worried that maybe this is a tactic from the defense attorneys. You know, they're trying to scare BF because she is supposed to testify when his trial eventually begins. It's really crazy, but her attorneys are trying to squash this they don't want her to go testify so i will keep you guys posted on what happens with that like i said when june comes around in a couple of weeks we're gonna have so much more information about this case so i'll definitely make a part three video updating you guys now there is more information that i could state but there is just so much speculation and theories about this case like i said there is a gag order in place but news nation has been coming out with a lot of information saying that they're getting this stuff from trusted sources they don't reveal who these sources are so they don't say, oh, we got this because Brian's attorney spoke to us or we got this from the family's attorney or we got this from, you know, investigators themselves. I mean, they don't name these trusted sources because again, there's a gag order. So no one is really supposed to be talking about the case. So a lot of people don't really know if they can trust what News Nation is stating. But I did just want to comment on some of the things they have come out with because I've been getting a lot of comments on my TikTok about it. But again, just a reminder, take these things with a grain of salt. Now, according to News Nation, an ID connected to one of the four victims was found during one of the searches of Brian Koberger's residences. So we're not sure if this potential ID was found at his family's home or if this ID was found at his own home. News Nation says that they exclusively learned this information and that police also believe they have evidence connecting Brian to allegedly cyber stalking one of the four victims. According to a search warrant that was unsealed earlier this year, it did reveal that police seized IDs from Brian's car, but they didn't specify who it was from. So they didn't state this ID belonged to Xana, this ID belonged to Madison, to Kaylee, to Ethan, to any of the four victims. All they said is that they did find some IDs. News Nation did try to confirm this statement that the ID belonged to one of the four victims, but they were not able to get confirmation from the police department or from any investigators on the case because like I've already said, there is a gag order in place. So as of now, we don't really know how accurate the statement is. We don't know if Brian actually has one of the three girls or Ethan's ID in his possession. That's pretty much all the major updates for this investigation. Like I've said, there has been more stuff that has come out from News Nation and their trusted sources, but I didn't really want to get into those until we have more confirmation. So I will keep you guys posted on what happens with the investigation. I just honestly hope that these four students get the justice that they deserve. Okay, Julio Ramirez. This is one of those cases that really got to me. I mean, they all get to me, but this one just made me so upset because how did this even happen and why? So just a quick refresher, on Wednesday, April 20th, 2022, 25-year-old Julio Ramirez decided to go out in Hell's Kitchen, which is a very popular neighborhood in New York City filled with bars and restaurants. He went out at around 7 p.m. to meet up with his friend Carlos. They started their night out on the town and they ended up at a place called the Ritz Bar and Lounge. When they got to the Ritz, Julio went to the bathroom and he actually took this selfie in the mirror, making a peace sign and then at around 2.53 in the morning, Julio sent Carlos a text message asking him where he was at. Carlos replied back and told Julio that he was still inside the bar. However, Julio told him, I'm actually outside, can you come meet me? Now, we're not really sure what happened after that, but at around 3.45 in the morning, almost an hour later, Carlos sent Julio another text message letting him know that he was already back at his apartment. He asked Julio, where are you? And he also asked him to come back to his apartment, but Julio never replied. The entire day on Thursday, April 24th, the morning Julio went missing, no one was able to get in contact with him. His family and friends started calling the local hospitals to see if maybe he had been in an accident and that's when Julio's parents received a phone call from Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital in Manhattan informing them that their son was dead and that Julio had actually been declared dead since 4.49 that morning. Now, the reason it took the hospital so long to inform them about his death 
is because when Julio was found, he was found without his wallet, without an ID, and without a cell phone. So at first, they labeled Julio as a John Doe because they had no idea who he was. But as soon as Julio's family started calling around, asking anyone if they had seen him, and you know, providing them with a description, that's when the hospital made the connection and realized that this was Julio. The hospital also told his family that his cause of death was a possible overdose. The NYPD started looking at surveillance footage near the Ritz, which was the last bar that Julio was at, and the footage showed Julio standing outside the bar alone for approximately 12 minutes before walking away. However, when he was walking away, he was no longer alone. Now he was walking alongside three unidentified men. They all called over a taxi at around 3.17 in the morning, and Julio and the three men got inside the cab. An hour later, a taxi driver approached an NYPD officer and told him that the passenger in his cab was unresponsive. The cop looked inside the cab and that's when he saw Julio sitting in the back seat alone. The officer and EMS tried to save his life, but unfortunately, Julio was pronounced dead at the nearby hospital at around 4.49 a.m. During the investigation, Julio's family also discovered that his bank accounts were completely drained between the day he died and April 25th. He had about $20,000 in his bank account and now that money was gone. Whoever drained his account had spent the money on purchases through Apple Pay, Zelle, and they had also purchased designer shoes. They had even gone to a spa, they had gone to fancy restaurants, and they had even bought kid Jordan shoes. After learning all of this, the family just knew that Julio was the victim of a homicide and that he was most likely targeted. Now, for a while, police had no clues as to who these three men were. Law enforcement were saying that maybe Julio's death was tied to a robbery ring in New York and that there was a pattern of a group going around robbing people in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood who had been drinking. A detective working on this theory said that the victims get inside the cab with these men and then they are coerced into handing over their bank details. However, Julio was the first person in these robberies that had died. Now, five weeks after Julio's death, another man was also found dead with similar circumstances. Now, I didn't mention this in my original video about Julio because at that time, detectives had not made the connection between what happened to Julio and what happened to this man. So 33-year-old John Umberger, who was a political consultant from Washington, D.C., was out with a group of friends in New York City when he disappeared after leaving a gay nightclub called The Q on May 28th. Now, as days went by, his mother, Linda, started to get worried for her son. He wasn't returning any of her phone calls, any of her messages, nothing. He went completely MIA, so she decided to call the police department and report her son as missing. He disappeared on May 28th, and a few days later on June 1st, police found John dead of an apparent drug overdose in the townhouse where he was staying. Police went to go look at the surveillance footage from the last known location, which was the queue, and that's when they saw that John was leaving the nightclub propped up by a group of men. Now, on top of drugs, being in his system, similar to Julio, he was also robbed and money was taken from his bank account. His mother Linda says that her son's cell phone was stolen, his credit cards were stolen, and that more than $25,000 were wiped from his bank account. Now, the medical examiner determined that John was killed by a lethal dose of fentanyl, heroin, coke, lidocaine, and ethanol. They originally thought that John, just like Julio, had died of an overdose, but despite the reports of it being an accidental overdose, John's mother, Linda, continued to push officials to consider the death of her son as a homicide. Just like Julio's family, Linda believed that her son did not overdose. Linda continued to push and push, and there was an NYPD detective named Randy Rose who was assigned to the case and was working really hard to figure out what had happened and who had done this. Randy started making the connection between what happened to John and what happened to Julio just five weeks earlier. He realized that both cases were connected and that a gang was operating in Hell's Kitchen gay clubs, drugging victims, and using cash apps on their phone to steal all of their money. Detective Randy really pushed the investigation forward, and in the end, he was right. A gang was responsible for what happened to Julio, John, and several other victims. On Friday, March 24th, 2023, so just a few weeks ago, six members of a gang were indicted over the Rufi murders of John Umberger and Julio Ramirez. The warrants were issued on Friday afternoon for the arrest of three of the men for first-degree murder, while all six men have been hit with charges of grand larceny and first-degree robbery, as well as conspiracy to drug and 
and rob at least a dozen victims. When I heard the news that Julio's killers had been caught, I just couldn't believe it. it. Just breaks my heart that John and Julio were just trying to have a night out with their friends. They were trying to have fun and instead they were drugged, robbed, and killed. It's amazing that Detective Randy and Julio's family and John's family were so persistent in stating that this was a homicide. Because of all their dedication and push for the truth, they were able to find it. I'm just so happy that detectives did not let this case go cold and you know my thoughts and prayers go out to Julio's family and John's family. I am so sorry that this happened to your loved one and I will be praying that Julio, John, and the other victims get the justice that they deserve. So now, last but not least, let's talk about Yanira Cedillos. I did do this video a while ago, so like I've mentioned, if you want to hear more about it, I will link it down below. But basically, to sum up, on Thursday, March 3rd, 2022, 30-year-old Yanira celebrated her 30th birthday with a group of friends in Moses Lake, Washington. The night started out great. You know, she was having fun celebrating the big 30, but throughout the night, the mood would suddenly change when Yanira started to receive hundreds of messages Messages, phone calls and snapchats from her ex-boyfriend Johnny Trujillo. He was messaging her asking her what she was doing, who she was with and he supposedly wanted to pull up and surprise her for her 30th birthday. Despite all the messages that Johnny was sending, Yanita decided to ignore him and just continued to have fun with her friends. At around midnight, some type of argument began between Yanita and some of her friends that went out with her and they were arguing in the parking lot of the bar. She was really upset so she decided decided to leave the group and she began walking southbound on Stratford Road. She ended up calling a friend and asked if he could come pick her up, which the friend said yes to. A short time later, the friend arrived to pick up Yanita, but she was nowhere to be found. He decided to call Yanita and ask her, where are you? And when Yanita picked up the phone, this friend could hear a male in the background yelling at Yanita asking her who was calling. Then all of a sudden, the phone call disconnected. A few moments later, Yanita calls this friend and she lets him know that everything is fine and that she no longer needed a ride home. However, the next morning on Friday, March 4th, Yanita never made it to work. The family started to get worried about what had happened to her, so they called the police department and they reported Yanita as missing. The police determined that the man heard in the background of the phone call between Yanita and her friend was her ex-boyfriend, Johnny. He actually picked her up from the side of the road and he took her back to her apartment. A few minutes after entering her unit to drop her off, Johnny killed Yanita. He was arrested on March 9th and he was charged with second degree murder and second degree rape and at the time was being held in the Umatilla County Jail on a $1 million bail. At the time that I made this video, Johnny remained quiet and he did not reveal where he had hid Yanita's body. The family wanted Johnny to just tell the truth and you know, let them know what had happened. They wanted to know where Yanita was. You know, she was a mother of three. Her kids needed to know where their mom was. They needed that closure and they needed to give her a proper burial. Yanita's sisters reached out to me and they asked me to make a YouTube video as well as a TikTok to help spread awareness to, you know, see if maybe someone had seen Johnny the day Yanita died and had seen where he had buried her. For a while, the family didn't know what happened, but on May 12, 2022, Yanita Cedillo's body was found. She was found in a remote area in Walla Walla County off Highway 12, just outside of Walua Junction. Her body was found on May 12, but was positively identified on May 16th. She was found inside of a sleeping bag covered with tree limbs and with leaves. I don't believe they have released her cause of death yet, but when Yanita's family heard the news, they were just completely heartbroken. They came out with a statement and it said, our lives have been a living nightmare since Yanita disappeared, but today we received the news we had been praying for. Yanita has been found and is coming home. Life will never be the same and we don't know how we will move on without her, especially her kids, but we find comfort knowing that she is resting and God will walk us through the painful days ahead. Yanita, my sweet sister, rest easy and know that we will take care of your babies. We will hold you in our hearts until we can hold you in our arms. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts to the entire community, family, friends, and news media for the support during these last two months. A special thank you to the entire Moses Lake Police Department for never giving up and keeping their promise to not rest until Yanita 
Anita was home. It makes me so angry that Johnny did this to someone he claimed he loved, to a mother of three. He just left her body in this remote area all by herself inside of a sleeping bag. You know, I'm just so happy that the police department did not stop looking for her. I was honestly worried that the case was gonna go cold, but at least Yanita's body has finally been found. Like I mentioned, Johnny was charged and he pleaded not guilty to second degree murder and second degree rape. He waived his right to appear in court during his hearing and his trial has been pushed back from May 10th to June 26th due to the large amount of evidence and information that the prosecution gave to Johnny's defense attorney. So yeah, Yanita's family doesn't really know when his trial will actually begin because his defense team just keeps pushing it back. You know, I honestly just feel bad for Yanita's family because I'm sure they just want to get this started. All we can do right now is continue to support them, continue to send them our thoughts and prayers and you know, just let them know that we're here for them and that we're praying that Yanita will get justice. At least Johnny has been arrested, at least he has been charged with murder, and at least her body has been found because at least they were able to give her a proper burial and you know there's a place where her kids can go visit her, talk to her, and spend time with her. Once again, my thoughts and prayers go out to Yanita's family and I will keep you guys posted on what happens with the trial. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. Wish there were more cases to update. I honestly wish all the unsolved cases that I've talked about on this channel were solved and that there were justice for the victims. Unfortunately, that's not the case, but that's why we have to continue to share these stories, spread awareness, and just show support and love to the families. Thank you guys so much for being here and for listening to today's video. I appreciate all the support and love that you guys show this channel. Like, I'm serious, you guys are truly amazing. If it wasn't for you guys, I would not be able to have this amazing platform where I can spread awareness on these cases and, you know, help push out these stories. Just a quick update on the podcast because I have been getting a couple of questions about that. Yes, the podcast is still happening. I saw your guys' comments about how you guys were confused as to why the videos were not on my channel and why they were on the Past Your Bedtime channel. You guys honestly made a good point. Like, as soon as I started reading those comments, I was like, wait, that's true. Like, these videos should be on my channel. So from now on, the podcast episodes will be on my channel. Channel. You can still listen to the audio version on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you know, any other podcast streaming platform. But if you want to see the video version of the podcast, that will only be exclusively on my channel. That's why there's a little bit of a pause because we're working on moving the videos to my channel and just restructuring things. So don't worry, it's coming back soon. I'm going to film another podcast episode on Tuesday. And yeah, I'm excited for the podcast to now be on my channel. So I always love hearing feedback from you guys. So thank you for bringing that to my attention and letting me know that you guys would prefer it to be on my channel. In the meantime, if you guys haven't listened to the first six episodes, I will link them down below so you guys can check them out. Once again, thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's video. And if you guys want to get 50% off your first Factor box, make sure to click the link down below. Mil, mil gracias for being here. And if there's ever any other cases that you guys want me to cover on this channel, make sure to leave me a comment down below. But yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.